Throughout this semester, we've been talking about DNA uh, on and off. We've been referencing it in various cellular processes. We talked about how the nucleus is a container for DNA, how that's where all the chromatin is stored. We talked about the nucleolus being a denser region of chromatin. In mitosis, we talked about the chromosome, so when that chromatin spools itself up nice and tight into little packages and how that is carefully separated. And I've also indicated what the purpose of DNA is, that it is uh, instructions for making proteins, for putting together a final product protein at the end. We talked about the interaction between the nucleus and the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then the rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on it, right? We're going to talk about those ribosomes again and how it sends it over to the Golgi apparatus. It sends vesicles containing polypeptides over to the Golgi apparatus for further modification. So we've talked about some of these ideas, but now we actually have to talk about the process of making DNA, what DNA specifically does, how we get information out of DNA. You've probably heard that DNA is the blueprint for making an organism, that it's the blueprint for making you, and that's true. Based on the sequence of nucleotides in your DNA, you could have freckles or no freckles. You could have hair, a hairline with a widow's peak uh, or a hairline with no widow's peak on it. It, it does indicate uh, what kinds of traits you're going to end up having. And those can be visible traits, as in you know, freckles or no freckles, or they could be uh, physiological traits, whether you're lactose intolerant or lactose tolerant. That's all controlled by your DNA. Now, to be clear, the DNA, you can't just read someone's DNA and know exactly what it is they look like and what all their traits are going to be, because there's an interaction between DNA and the environment in which the organism is brought up in. Now, using what we know about DNA, what we've been able to do is take specific genes. A gene is a segment of DNA that codes for one particular protein. We've taken specific genes from one organism, and then we've transplanted it into another organism. We've uh, created transgenic organisms or genetically modified organisms. You've heard of GMOs uh, in news, probably. So here on this image, we have a couple of laboratory mice, and these are transgenic mice. Typically, mice do not glow in the dark. That's, that's the first thing you should know about mice. Uh, but if you were to take a gene from a bioluminescent organism, certain kinds of fungi are bioluminescent, certain types of bacteria, uh, certain uh, aquatic creatures, you know, jellyfish and these sort of things, you take a gene from a bioluminescent creature, you put it into the uh, first fertilized cell, the embryo, the single cell from which all other cells in that organism are eventually going to arise through mitosis, well, that gene is then going to be throughout that entire organism's body when they finally develop to maturity. So every single cell would have the capacity to produce this bioluminescent chemical that causes it to glow in the dark. So you can go from having normal white lab mice to having glow-in-the-dark mice. And we do this with all kinds of organisms. Sometimes we do it in order to uh, be sure that the transgenic genes that we're trying to put into an organism have actually been taken up. So whether or not they glow in the dark is a good indicator that, yes, that gene was taken up, and maybe some of the other genes we tried to put in, therefore, were taken up as well. Now, we've known about DNA since uh, the 1800s. It was discovered by a scientist by the name of Friedrich Miescher. Uh, and Miescher was working as a kind of assistant for another scientist who was a, a kind of big deal at the time, but uh, I'm not remembering his name, and I do remember Frederick Miescher's. Uh, that scientist that he was working for had done the Herculean task of taking red blood cells and extracting every single chemical inside those red blood cells. He basically came up with a list, a, a complete list of all the chemicals that you could find in a particular red blood cell. So he's, oh, there are phospholipids in here, there's protein in here, you got the hemoglobin, you got all these different chemicals, every single thing inside that cell. So massive accomplishment that, and uh, appropriately, he was given quite a bit of renown. So Frederick Miescher, is coming in as his assistant, and this scientist says to him, hey, Fred, uh, what I need you to do is basically copy everything I did with red blood cells, but you should do it with white blood cells. So just follow the procedure that I laid out, and that will be uh, your project, Frederick, to work on. Now, here's the thing. 
Red blood cells, at a certain stage of their development, jettison a lot of cellular contents. They jettison their mitochondria. Red blood cells can only gain energy through glycolysis. They jettison their nuclei, so they don't have any DNA to speak of inside the red blood cells. So when Friedrich Miescher wanted to sequence white blood cells, he found this material, deoxyribonucleic acid, what he called nuclein, uh, that was just not present inside the red blood cells, some completely new biological material that no one had really ever noticed before. So the first thing he did is, well, you want to sequence all the chemicals inside white blood cells, you need a rich source of white blood cells. Where am I going to get white blood cells, just a whole massive amount of white blood cells. Well, he came up with an idea. He went around and canvassed various hospitals in the area, and he asked them to take all of the used bandages they had, which had lots and lots of pus on them, and pus is mostly white blood cells. There's a lot of white blood cells just kind of in the pus. That's part of your body's immune response to having an injury. He took them, and he put them all into a big pot, and he dissolved all the white blood cells away in there, and he had this massive amount of white blood cells. So sometimes biology is gross, but it's always fascinating. So. Frederick says, I don't know what this material is. He, he, took, he takes his uh, bottle of white blood cells and he puts in an enzyme that dissolves away all of the lipids. He puts in an enzyme that dissolves away all of the protein. He puts in an enzyme that dissolves away all of the carbohydrates and he's left with this material, which he calls nucleon because it was obviously concentrated in the nucleus. Uh, which has phosphate inside of it, which is strange because at that time in biology we thought that everything interesting about cells, everything interesting about biology was all about proteins. And you guys know that I'm partial to proteins. They do all of the work inside the cell, but proteins do not contain phosphorus. They have nitrogen. Some, uh, a lot of proteins are going to have sulfur in them because that's uh, a group attached to uh, their central carbon there for some amino acids, but they don't have any phosphorus. So the thought was that maybe nucleon DNA is a storage container for phosphorus for the cell. Maybe that's what its purpose is, but Friedrich never really accepted that. And he wrote down in his uh, paper in the kind of like notes section, you can submit letters to the editor, that he is confident that at some point in the future, nucleon will prove to be an important discovery. I mean, he discovered it, so obviously he's a little bit biased in that, but it turned out he was correct. As we continue doing more and more experiments on uh, heredity and how traits uh, manifest themselves in organisms and how traits are passed from one generation to the next, we started to realize that it was not proteins that were transferring the genetic information, transferring that information about how to develop an organism, it was the DNA that was doing it. And I'll show you some of those experiments that we did in a moment. So DNA research really starts ramping up in the following century. Uh, and one of the big things, one of the big mysteries to discover was what does DNA actually look like? What is the shape of DNA? Now that seems like a weird thing, like it's a chemical, who cares what, what shape it looks like? The question is what it does, right? But if you want to understand the function of something, you have to understand what it looks like. You have to understand what shape it has. Imagine you were taking a class in um, repairing engines, a mechanics class, and they told you everything about the engine. They told you about spark plugs, and they told you about gears, and they told you about crankshafts, and they told you all this stuff, but at no point were you ever actually shown an engine or shown a diagram of an engine. You have no idea what these things look like. You don't understand how the parts work together. How could you really imagine the full functional engine if you've never seen it, if you don't know what the shape is? The shape of an object tells you about its function. A hammer has a very particular shape because it's designed to perform a particular job. This end has one function, the opposite end has another function, and then this handle nicely fits your, your hand here. So you can tell that this was designed with a human hand in mind. It was designed to perfectly fit right in that location. Even if you were a space alien and you were coming down to Earth for the first time, looking at these objects, seeing the shape of them might give you some clues as to what their purpose is. That was the thing with DNA. Now, some of the best scientists in the world committed themselves to trying to figure out what the shape of DNA was. One of them, a guy by the name of Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling is one of the greatest chemists 
uh, that has ever lived. He is the one who figured out how proteins spontaneously fold themselves into their three-dimensional shape. He proved it mathematically. He did a lot of good work on that topic. Uh, he thought, okay, well, you know, I'm Linus Pauling, I'm, I'm great, I'm a Nobel laureate, I can crack this DNA problem over the weekend, no problem. And he puts out a version of uh, the model of DNA that has all of the phosphate groups of DNA facing towards each other, right next to each other, and he has it as a triple-stranded uh, molecule. Now, Pauling's son was actually going to school with a couple of other guys at this time. Their names are Watson and Crick, James Watson and Francis Crick. And he gave them an advanced copy of his dad's paper. And when they read it, they said, oh my goodness, he's wrong. It's, this is not correct, because they had actually come up with the same model a few years earlier, and one of their colleagues, a woman by the name of Rosalind Franklin, had explained to them why that is not possible, because phosphate groups are negatively charged, so they can't be right next to each other uh, in, and hold the DNA together, right? If you have two strands of negatively charged material, they can't be right next to each other. They're going to repel away. So they realized that they have the scoop on one of the greatest scientists around at the time. They can actually prove him wrong, and that would really make a good name for themselves, especially because their supervisor, their, um, their professor, actually had a somewhat of a rivalry with Linus Pauling. So when they brought this to that professor, he said, okay, we're gonna clear the books, you're just gonna work on this DNA thing, and we're gonna see if we can beat uh, Linus Pauling uh, to the punch here. Now, Watson and Crick were kind of unusual scientists for the day. They didn't do any experiments themselves. They weren't hands-on kinds of guys. What they tended to do was read other people's papers, read the results of other experiments, and then they would sit around having a, you know, a stroke your chin meeting, just uh, sitting around and think about it. Well, maybe they got this result because of this. Maybe they got this result because of this. If we take these 10 papers together and we think about them and look at them at the big picture, maybe this is what that kind of indicates. Uh, now, nowadays, that kind of science is, is actually a lot more common. You guys are, uh, in Bio 110, you guys are reading review papers, so you know that it's really common to read a whole bunch of material and try to distill down some ideas. And we have letters to science and all that kind of thing in order to talk about, you know, maybe this or maybe that. But at the time, it was kind of unusual to not do your own experiments. And they came up with a new model, a different model of DNA, which is that it was a double helix. Two strands, two polynucleotide strands going down, and they're going to hydrogen bond with each other. So in the Watson and Crick model of DNA, there's two polynucleotide strands. Each nucleotide is made of phosphates and sugars. With a nitrogenous base, a nitrogen containing ring uh, hanging off the side. So we have the sugar phosphate backbone. You might remember that from unit one. And then we have these nitrogenous bases hanging off here, A, T, C, and G. Now, there was one piece of information that Watson and Crick uh, had in the forefront of their mind that Linus Pauling did not. There was a guy by the name of Chargoff, and Chargoff had come up with a really interesting result in his experiments with DNA. He realized that if a sample of DNA was, say, 20% adenine, 20% A, then it was always 20% thymine as well. If it was 30% cytosine, then it was always 30% guanine as well. That the values, the quantities of these nucleotides in any sample of DNA were paired together. And that implied that there were two strands of DNA. Pauling thought there might be three strands of DNA, but when Chargoff told Pauling about this, he was on vacation and he didn't want to hear it. So he said, get out of here, Chargoff, but Watson and Crick, they listened, they heard. Uh, the implication here. So, uh, 
we have two strands of polynucleotides, two polynucleotide strands, sugar, phosphate, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. And what Watson and Crick realized from Chargoff's result is that there's some mechanism, some chemical mechanism that's causing these quantities to become paired. So the only way they could think of for that to happen is if it was a two-stranded molecule and there was some kind of bonding going on between the strands that required A and T to match up. Wherever you have an A, you have a T on the other side. Whenever you have a T, you have an A on the other side. These are what we call base pairs. Base pairs. Base pairs hold the two polynucleotide strands together through hydrogen bonding. You remember those hydrogen bonds, those weak little hydrogen bonds that hold water molecules together and give water all its interesting properties? They are also holding together your DNA strands. You have six feet of DNA inside every single one of your cell. You take a skin cell, you open up the nucleus, you get six feet of DNA coming out. Hydrogen bonds are very, very weak on their own, but with six feet of this molecule uh, to, to hold it together, there's a, it's a very strong. It can be a very strong additive mechanism, like Velcro, almost. So whenever you have a T, you have an A, and whenever you have a C, you also have a G. And then Chargoff's result made sense to them. And another interesting uh, implication of Chargoff's result was that if you know how much of any nucleotide there is in any sample of DNA, you can figure out how much there is of every other one. Let's say you have a sample and it is 15% adenine, 15% adenine, right? So 15% A, I'm going to make it nice and big so you guys can read it even on the tiny screen. Well there's always going to be an equal amount of T. So it will also be 15% T. Now, if you add these together, you get 30%, and all of the rest of the sample must be C and G. So it's 70% C and G, which also must show up in equal amounts. So you divide 70 by 2, and you get 35. So our sample would be 15% A, 15% T, 35% C, and 35% G at the end. Now, having a model is wonderful, but what's better than a model is having experimental results. And Watson and Crick were not experimentalists, but they did know some experimentalists. There was a guy by the name of Maurice Wilkins and one by the name of Rosalind Franklin who were doing experiments uh, on DNA uh, using what's called X-ray crystallography. It's incredibly useful for taking um, essentially photographs uh, using X-rays of very complicated molecules. We recently, relatively recently, used it to crack the structure of ribosomes as well, which we'll talk about a little bit later on this unit. Now, there were other people that were doing X-ray crystallography, but they were using old, dried out DNA. Franklin, Rosalind Franklin, came up with the idea of using uh, DNA from squid sperm, fresh DNA that they had just really harvested, nice wet DNA. So they got higher quality images than any other team. Now they themselves were on the track of seeing this double helix, this two-stranded DNA molecule. And they knew that if they had a double helix, that the X-ray crystallographic image that came back would have this uh, X shape on it. A helix is a spiral. Uh, it's a molecule that goes around like a spiral staircase. And if you have two strands, they cross over each other at some point. So they were looking for that result. James Watson was having lunch with Maurice Wilkins one day, and they were talking about this problem. You know, scientists were a chatty bunch. Uh, and he says, oh, you know what? We actually, we got some results uh, recently. Uh, Rosalind Franklin, she, she just got this x-ray crystallographic photo. Why don't you have a look at it? 
he shows them her photo without ever having asked her permission or gotten consent for that. And as soon as Watson and Crick see this photo, they know that they have the right model of DNA. They know there's experimental results to prove their model of DNA to be correct. So they ran off and they put together a one-page paper, a one-page letter uh, to the journal Nature that said, DNA is a double helix, we can prove it, and they got scientific priority for that claim. Scientific priority is a big deal. Uh, we still call it the Watson and Crick model of DNA instead of the Watson, Crick, and Franklin model of DNA, or the uh, Wilkins and Franklin model of DNA. Now, Watson and Crick ended up getting the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the structure of DNA. Maurice Wilkins shared that Nobel Prize. So those three guys up on stage, Rosalind Franklin, who had done the X-ray crystallography, uh, actually died of cancer prior to that being awarded. So it's thought that maybe she would have uh, shared in that Nobel Prize, but we don't award Nobel Prizes posthumously, uh, so she never got quite the uh, amount of recognition that she really should have. So the discovery of DNA had, was not accomplished really by one person. Understanding everything we do about DNA has taken the work of hundreds of scientists, and I've only had time to mention a couple of them here. So. What do we know about DNA? We know it's a two-stranded molecule. We know it can duplicate itself. That's very, very good at copying itself, which makes it an excellent carrier of information. As you go from one cell to two cells to four cells and on and on and on, the most important thing that you can make sure that each daughter cell is going to have is a copy of the DNA. So the fact that DNA can copy itself is very important to its role 